Shalom, this is Chris. Let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Deuteronomy chapters 12 and 13. We're beginning the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic law section here. Father, we ask you to bless our study and have us be like the Bereans who receive the word with all eagerness, but examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. By this teaching, enable each of us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. And with this specific section, please open our eyes to what you would have us learn from this ancient law code. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One way to organize the book of Deuteronomy is in the style of an ancient suzerain and vassal treaty. That's an ancient treaty that was typically in invoked when a coming king would take over a land and expect you know, all of his subjects to just be grateful and be compliant and obedient and all that. Uh, and so we've got a similar layout here with the book of Deuteronomy, except God is God. And God is saying, um, I'm not going to be like the other kings. I'm going to be you know, beneficial for you, and but I do still have behaviors that I expect. And, uh, and so anyway, the book of Deuteronomy is laid out like one of these treaties. So we had the preamble, we had the historical prologue, and then chapter four began a series of stipulations. These would be the terms and conditions of the contract. So we have the general uh, stipulations that we've just completed, chapters 4 through 11. And basically, uh, if we were to use an example, uh, we would have the general statement like, you shall have no other gods before me. That's in one of the Ten Commandments. Now, chapter 12, all the way through chapter 26, begins the specific stipulations. And so we're going to get, for example, uh, in, in to, to build on no other gods before me, we're going to have many specific rules on idolatry, clearing the land. What do you do with a, a false um, prophet and, and all of that? We're going to see those in the next couple of chapters. So as we, we go through these stipulations, um, you know, the, the law code, we'll call it, we're going to try to point out the surface level application, but often the literal application won't apply to us. It won't, it'll be for, for that time and for that land. But, you know, to be Bereans, we'll want to look for opportunities to create spiritual application for us that seeks to be true to God's intent behind the specific statute. For example, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12 will talk about smashing idols whenever you see them in the land. Now, in context, that is only for uh, Israelites that are taking over Canaanite lands and um, you know, they're, they're instructed to smash idols. We can't go around smashing idols. I talked about this in the last video. Uh, but what can we do? What can we do to rid our lives of idolatry? And then in chapter 27, 28, uh, the, the continuing this outline here, we'll have the sanctions, which is the blessings and the cursings. Uh, and then we'll have a summary recapitulation. And then finally, we'll have the, you know, like a contract would have, we, we, this contract will automatically renew uh, after, you know, 12 months. Um, Deuteronomy has the perpetuity and disposition. What happens next? What happens uh, in, in the future, 31 through 40, 34. We're going to try and cover more ground than we usually would. We usually go a chapter at a time, but here, uh, a lot of this is going to be self-explanatory, so we'll have bigger chunks to read. Deuteronomy 12, verses 1 through 4. These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall carefully follow in the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given to you to possess as long as you live on the earth. So see right away, this specific set of instructions is only uh, directly applicable in the land. So obviously, we could skip the whole thing and say it doesn't apply to us, but then we'd m be missing the point because this passage and uh, the next several chapters are really telling us the heart of God. What does God like? What does he not like? And it is a gift to receive that. And we'll talk about later that the ancients didn't have that. They didn't know what their gods wanted. And so here our God is telling us exactly what he wants. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you are going to dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains, on the hills, under every leafy tree. And you shall tear down their altars and smash their memorial stones to pieces and burn their ashram in the fire and cut to pieces the carved images of their gods. And you shall eliminate their name from that place. You shall not act this way towards the Lord your God. We have a chiastic structure. I'm not going to go deep into it, but it's all throughout chapter 12. So you can see it begins with the command to carefully follow God. And then it's going to end in verse 32. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. And then the first instruction back in verse 2, you shall utterly destroy all the places where they serve their gods. And then it's going to circle back to that in verse 31. You know, all, all of the things which talking about the gods of the Canaanites. So we've got this mirrored structure, inverted parallel structure here. Um, apparently the Canaanites had pagan shrines and altars everywhere. Our English translations tend to be a little polite. They call them memorial stones. They're actually pillars. Um, let's just say it would be the male representation. The ashram or the ashra poles would be the female uh, representation. Uh, Asherah was said to be the wife of Baal, the mother of all the other gods. And you can see on the screen, you know, we've got symbolic, uh, you know, exaggerated sexual features and all that kind of thing. They're in, they're, it's not so much that they were sex crazed like our society would be, although I'm, I'm sure that had a play into it. Money, sex, and power have always been 
been prime targets for the enemies. Specifically though, in that culture, they wanted productive crops and animals. So the tree, in addition to being a, a phallic symbol, would also be something that bore fruit. And so they wanted um, they wanted the trees to kind of you know be, be productive. And so they, they modeled that out. They wanted to bear fruit economically, and they represented that in sexual terms. That's just the way the ancients did things. Of course, God is saying, you shall have none of these because we are to tear down, smash, burn, cut to pieces, eliminate. I mean, how, how, how much clearer could God be here? Usually what conquering armies did was they would repurpose such shrines to honor their gods. You know, they would make a statement as if to say, your gods didn't help you. You, know, you will worship our gods now. Rome exactly did this when they took over. Emperor Hadrian, early in the uh, second century, built pagan temples on the Temple Mount, on Jesus's tomb in Jerusalem, and in Bethlehem on Jesus's birthplace, as, as if to say, you know, this God is dead, my God is alive. What he ended up doing, though, was marking those places so that a, a couple of hundred years later, when Constantine came in and, and the Christian era uh, began in Jerusalem, we knew exactly where these places were. Uh, the Church of the Nativity and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre are, are very likely historically accurate, partially because uh, we have Emperor Hadrian to thank because he put pagan, pagan uh, tombs there, because that's what they did. They wanted to say our God was better. In contrast, though, look what God wants. That's what the nations did. God says, you're, my people are to have no part of this. You're not to repurpose any of this, but you're to destroy them and leave them desolate. Their, their name should be erased from history as if it never existed. And this is in contrast to what we'll see in the next verse is God's name, which is to be magnified and lifted high. Now, despite all these warnings, Israel's history will demonstrate idolatry is a constant problem in the land, and ultimately it will lead to the Babylonian exile. Um, beginning in the early, uh, sorry, the, the, the late 500s, and we're counting backwards. So 585, I've 86 was, was the big time for the big exile. In terms of surface level application, the Jewish sages point out that this command only applies to Jews living within the land of Israel. And they say specifically Jews living in the diaspora, that is outside of Israel and other countries, should not go around tearing down idolatrous shrines, as in the end it would not go well for them. And um, we have a, a similar injunction. We can't really tear down, uh, you know, that would be called vandalism, and that will be called destruction of private property. We can't do these things, but do we nonetheless have an opportunity to honor God through this commandment? And we can do that by not tolerating adultery, I'm sorry, adultery or idolatry in our midst. And so in, in our day, this calls for nothing short of a radical commitment to purity. And we have this warning because in the days of the apostles, idolatry was mainstream. First John, little children, keep yourself from idols. First Thessalonians actually gives us what we're supposed to do with, with those who are practicing idolatry. As much as we might want to, our answer to paganism is not to tear down their shrines, but to realize that the pagan is a lost soul who needs to hear the gospel. This is how Paul stood against the paganism in his day. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9 for they themselves report how you turn to God from idols to serve a true and living God. That's how Paul defeated paganism. In cities like Ephesus, um, where there was big time pagan worship, a few hundred years later, there's eventually a church that will be built over where, you know, where the temple to Diana once stood. That's how we defeat paganism, is by sharing the gospel. And of course, we need to root it out of our own lives. So that could mean voting with our feet. We may, maybe we shouldn't support those who uh, support and and promote idolatry and immorality. We may need to give up that brand or stop following that uh, that athlete or actor. Uh, you know who's, who's doing these things. Look at your subscriptions. Is your money going to support idolatry? You know, canceling those subscriptions may be one way we can spiritually tear down these pagan altars that are around us. Internally, it says uh, you should not act this way towards the Lord, and that means as followers of God, we have to rid ourselves of idolatry or any other kind of disrespect to God in our worship. We're going to talk about worship a little bit later as we move through the chapter, but in our personal lives, our homes, our churches, anywhere else where we have influence, we need to be constantly on guard to prevent idolatry and up uplift Jesus' name. Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 7, but you shall seek the Lord at that place, that's an interesting term, which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name. For there is his dwelling, you shall come there. You shall bring there your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, tithes, contribution of your land, your vowed offerings, your voluntary offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. There you and your household shall eat before the Lord your God and rejoice in all your undertakings, which the Lord your God has blessed you. We looked at this in the introductory video and just a way to look at this is God is inviting us into fellowship with him. So not so much, you know, you you must rejoice, but how about you're welcome to rejoice. I want you to rejoice uh, before me and in, in fellowship with me. This place, uh, it, it's, it's Hamakom in Hebrew. It's not
not named in Deuteronomy. We're going to see that it's going to come up a lot. And uh, through progressive revelation, we learned it comes to mean Jerusalem. That the place is first mentioned in Genesis 22. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And that becomes uh, equivalent to Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is eventually the location where God confirms to David that the permanent dwelling for God is supposed to be. But until then, um, the, the place was wherever the tabernacle was. So for several hundred years, the tabernacle remained at Shiloh. But we're going to see this term, the place, uh, as, as we work throughout Deuteronomy. So just keep an eye on, on that. Again, we looked at this last time. There you and your household shall eat. And this is this is a, a welcoming. This is an invitation. Going back to what we said in the introduction last time, God is inviting his children to share a meal with him. And so ordering someone to rejoice and blessings is a bit nonsensical. These commands are an invitation for us to have fellowship with him. And uh, so a spiritual application, we know from many other commands, the intent for God's offerings was to bring their best. We bring our best to God's first and to, to God first. We see here that people make voluntarily, uh, they make offerings uh, on top of other offerings that are required. They have some that are voluntary as well. We can't apply this to our day. We, just, we give God our best and remember that he desires fellowship and desires that we rejoice as he invites us into his house. And we have several references to that. Uh, John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. Um, I would have told you I'm going to there to prepare a place for you. So God is bringing us into his fellowship, and so we should be bringing our best for that. Um, whenever we meet with him, this might mean dressing up for church, not as a got to, but just as a show of honor. Uh, if, if we would dress up for meeting a human dignitary, then um, you know, then maybe we want to think about how casual we are being with our relationship with God. To another, this might mean holding off on buying some big thing in order to use that money to send someone else, use it, use it for the kingdom. Um, after the gifts, then God wants us to celebrate that blessing. So think about what offerings we can bring to en enhance our fellowship and joy. Verse 8, you shall not do at all what we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in their own eyes. So Moses doesn't elaborate on this, but apparently there was some you know element of people going their own way, even though God is specifically saying what, uh, what he wants. Strictly speaking, this is not one of the 613 commandments. It's more of an overarching command along the lines of Micah 6, 8. He has told you what is good, what does the Lord require to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. So walk humbly means we're not doing what is right in our own eyes. We are to be different and, and set apart. Um, we need to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They're, they refuse to bow when the rest of the world is bowing. Too many of us try to blend in, but God says, no, follow my way uh, and, and be distinct that way. And so one thing to demonstrate our loyalty to God might be to give up things we otherwise want to do, but would ultimately interfere in our relationship. And so let's do a, some self-assessment and figure out what those things might be. Verse 9, for you have not come as yet to the resting place and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. When you cross the Jordan and live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around you so that you live in security, then it shall come about that the place in which the Lord your God will choose for his name to dwell. There you shall bring everything that I command you, your burnt offerings, sacrifices, tithe, contribution of your hand, choice vowed offerings, which you vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Again, a cheerful giving heart can rejoice before the Lord. Perhaps one that only gives out of obligation or only gives the minimum. Uh, they're, they're not going to be as, uh, as able to rest or rejoice. Celebration and fellowship, note it's a, it's a family affair. And in our celebrations, we are to remember, we are to remember and if possible include those who are less fortunate, those uh, who are maybe on the outskirts and those who, who are at risk of being forgotten. Verse 13, be careful that you do not offer your burnt offerings in any cultic place that you see, but only in the place the Lord chooses. In one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings and there you shall do everything that I command you. However, you may slaughter and eat meat when any of within any of your gates. That means within your cities. They had gated cities back then. Uh, whatever you desire, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you, the unclean and the clean alike may eat it as the gazelle and the deer. That refers to um, when you go to the temple, you've got to be in a clean state, but in, in your own town, uh, you don't have to maintain this high level of purity. That's an error the Pharisees made, by the way, in Jesus's day. They they believed they had to be uh, ritually clean at all times. But here God's saying, no, that's, that's not necessary. Only when you come into the temple. Only you shall not eat the blood. You are to pour it out on the ground like water. Moses is opening the door here. God through Moses is opening the door. Not so much a list of things they can't do, but here, don't don't focus on that. Focus on what you can do. Focus on the freedom you have. There's there's great freedom in these verses. Um, mixing of religion, which is called syncretism, was a problem for the Israelites. And so the first part about not offering in any place that you see, I don't I don't want mixing of my commands or my offerings meant for me alongside you know Baal. Um, what they were doing, they ended up doing that. They ended up worshiping 
worshiping God alongside with Baal. It wasn't that they left God and started following Baal. They, they were trying to do both at the same time. God says in the first verse, you know, don't tolerate that. Um, you know, on, only do uh, what, what, I, what I command you. This and the next several verses, they're going to be very specific commands for the Israelite living in the land and in the setting of the Levit Levitical priesthood. So this, is, would, this would be one of those commands that we can't do today, but Look at the look at the intent. The intent is to be rejoicing and and giving God our best. The pagans, as we mentioned earlier, they had to guess at what their gods, their small g gods, wanted. They they would have seen the fact that God took the time to tell His people what He wanted would be a supreme blessing and a supreme act of grace. These commands get at the heart of what God wants in terms of worship. We are not to do our own thing and call it worship and assume God is going to bless it. And so the application for us is to be cautious, very cautious. We don't have specific examples of worship in our day, but just in general, uh, our worship needs to be pure. Does the Bible say we shouldn't have smoke machines in church? No, it doesn't. Uh, but does the Bible say that worship services should be done in modesty and free from distractions? Yes. Uh, and so to the extent that our many of our worship services look like worldly rock concerts, is that a problem? And, uh, you know, I would tend to say, yes, <laughs> it's not meant to be that. We're, we're not meant to have all these distractions and, and be entertained. And that's up for the pastor and the elders of those churches to work through that. But I, I would encourage anyone to ask that question, at least. Um, we learn from this passage also that true worship is communal. It's a family affair. It's, it's for your community. It's not individualistic. So then why do we sing songs like, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down? It seems like the better song would be, here we are to worship. This is a, a community. Um, Daniel Block writes, true worship, true worship does not take accuse from the world. True worship according to the will is according to the will of the one we worship. Only God can define what acceptable worship looks like. You are not allowed to eat within your gates the tithe of your grain, new wine or oil, or the firstborn of your flock, or any of your vowed offerings, which you vow your voluntary offerings, or the contribution of your hand. You shall eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God will choose. In other words, bring bring your first offering to the temple. Uh, you and your son and daughter and your male and female slaves. And the Levite who is within your gates, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all your undertakings. Be careful that you do not abandon the Levite as long as you live within the land. So again, this thought of rejoicing and, and uh, celebrating, fellowshipping with God, but no, it's on his terms. Certain offerings must be brought to God's house. They were not allowed to say, here's my offering. I'm going to enjoy it right here. So while it's true that God is everywhere uh, and, and everywhere believers are gathered, there he is. He is present in a special way in a dedicated house of worship. Now, this may be in a private home. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a church building as long as the gathering is set apart. Um, then then it's okay, but not all private homes are set-apart gatherings. God wants us to be set apart to him when we have specific fellowship times. And, and to do that is not so much a got-to, but it's a get-to. Because if we neglect the, the fellowship, then we're missing out on, on a blessing and just being with each other. When the Lord your God extends your border as he has promised you, and you say, I will eat meat because you desire to eat meat, then you may eat meat. Notice the freedom and the celebration and, and the, the, the joy in these verses. Whatever you desire. If the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter, interesting word there, animals from your herd and flock, which the Lord has given you as I have commanded you, and you may eat within your gates whatever you desire. So you hear this, this optional uh, tone here in, in bringing offerings. And it's clearly focus on what you have, not what you don't have. Focus on the freedom to be set apart from God. The word for slaughter is, uh, is a Hebrew word that means sacrifice. And it almost always has a sacred as opposed to a common connotation. In other words, every meal is an opportunity to give an offering, to give thanks to God and invite him into fellowship. I'm not sure we look at our meals that way, but, um, but with every meal, something had to die for you, <laughs> whether it's a vegetable who had to be plucked from their life source or, or an animal that had to be slaughtered. For you to be nourished, there, there was a sacrifice required, and we can look at our meals as a sacrifice um, to him and, and an opportunity to, to be in fellowship. Just as a gazelle or deer is eaten, so you may eat it. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it. Only be sure not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you shall not eat the life with the flesh. You shall not eat it or pour it on the ground like water. You shall not eat it so that it may go well for you and your sons after you, since you will be doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. For the Christian, this command is specifically restated in Acts 15. And we have these four prohibitions for new Gentile believers. Um, they, they did not have the full restrictions of the, the Jewish dietary laws, but they were 
to abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from acts of sexual immorality. If you do keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So not uh, not so much the clean and unclean animals part, but I think they would have said that if that's what they meant. But we have to, uh, at least in that day, idolatry in food was a big problem. And the early church was telling its believers to stay, stay clear of that and um, obtain uh, uh, follow the guidelines for uh, kosher sacrifice is basically what they're saying here. Verse 26, only your holy things, which you may have and your vowed offerings, you shall take and go to the place where the Lord chooses. And you shall offer your burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood on the altar of the Lord your God and the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God and you shall eat the flesh. Be careful and listen to all these words which I'm commanding you so that it may go well for you and your sons after you forever. For you will be doing what is good and right in the sight of the Lord. Don't, isn't that what we want? We want to do what's good and right. Uh, so we have two choices. Do what is right in our own eyes or do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And I think the value of studying this is to learn God's heart because the it's been said that the law is really God's will. And if we want to know what is good and right in the sight of the Lord, uh, we should be doing exactly what we're doing in studying the law. When the Lord your God cuts you off from the nations which you are going to dispossess, you are to dispossess them and live in their land. Be careful you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from your presence and that you do not inquire about their God saying, how do these nations serve their gods that I may do likewise? Don't even ask that question. You shall not behave this way because every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. So these Canaanites were exceedingly wicked. Let's not forget that. For even they burned their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. Now, many believe that God stopping Abraham in Genesis 22 from sacrificing Isaac was emphasizing the fact that human sacrifice is a moral outrage. Um, to the best of our knowledge, all of the other ancient cultures practice some form of human sacrifice. And while this context is specific to the Israelites in the land, uh, we can't allow anything God abhors to take root in our lives. And as much as it is within our control, we have to stand against this in our society. Believe me, child sacrifice in various ways still very much occurs today. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to or take anything away from it. And this is a verse that many of us may recognize from Revelation that was specific to the words of the prophecy. But here in Deuteronomy, we've got the entire book saying don't add or take away. This command is definitely binding on us today. While we try to understand God's word and make it relevant, we need to focus primarily on exegesis. That's taking concepts from the text. Text. We need to be very careful with eisegesis, which is reading stuff in. Now, we're always going to read our culture and our context to try and get at what God wants us to do. But we have to do so with a heart that desires to know God better and not push any agenda or anything like that. Making distinctions between laws that apply and, and how to interpret them is not the same as saying part of God's word is canceled and no longer relevant. A lot of Protestants would say that about Deuteronomy, and that's not okay because that's, in a sense, taking away from the word of God. Jesus was actually okay with tradition, so we, we, we have to ask, do traditions do this? Do traditions add or take away? And if a particular tra tradition does not contradict the commandment of God, then Jesus was okay with it. If it did, that's when he got upset, and that that tradition should be discarded. While many of our church traditions don't necessarily add to or subtract uh, from God's word, many do. And we should examine those and if necessary, remove those. There's a fantastic book called Pagan Christianity that talks a lot about this and how this intermingling and asking, uh, you know, we're just so used to this, but if you trace it back to the beginning, it had a, a pagan root. One example is the steeple. There's no command that, that there needs to be a steeple on a church. And so why is there? Yet we've got all these commands about, you know, tearing down the high places, and you know the standing stones and 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 you know the other you know those types of things. So why do we have that on our church? Good question to ask. We should explore that a little bit. Chapter thirteen. If a prophet or dreamer, we're going to talk about uh, false prophets now. If a prophet or dreamer arises among you, gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign comes true of which he spoke, and then you say, "Let's follow other gods. Let's serve them." You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. Dream. So this is a test. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. Just because a a thing comes true um, th does not mean that the person's not a false prophet. So we need to be very careful uh, and we need to never give attention to false prophets. And basically this is saying every day we can look at it as a test when we have a choice to make. We can cho choose to follow God or choose to follow the world. Those little choices will end up being Bi uh, you know, big choices, and those big choices define who we are. Luke 16, 10, the one who's faithful in the very little thing is also faithful in much. One who is unrighteous in a very little thing is also unrighteous in much. So from the entire passage, we see some instructions for testing a false prophet. The prediction made must be fulfilled, although that alone 
is not the test of whether a prophet is true or false. It, it would specifically be they the predictions made must never not be fulfilled. Uh, it's, it's actually a, in a negative form. A prophet is not necessarily from God if what they say comes to pass. We can see Matthew 24 saying false prophets will provide signs and wonders to deceive the elect if that were possible. But a prophet is definitely false if anything they say does not come to pass. A prophet is also false if they speak in the name of other of another god or other gods. And if a prophet is false if they speak against keeping the commands of the Torah. God wants discernment. We need to be able to identify false prophets, but we also need to be ready to listen to true prophets, and we have to identify those as well. Signs and miracles, again, don't confirm a false prophet, but a prophet who does signs and wonders and then points to God and leads others to the Bible is someone we should listen to. Verse 4, you should follow the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commands, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. But the prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken falsely against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to drive you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so shall you eliminate the evil among you. Obviously, we cannot uh, go around killing people we don't like, but we can eliminate the evil from among us. Uh, we need to detect false prophets, and uh, if they're within our community, we should attempt to correct them and restore them. And if they're unrepentant, then we need to remove them from, from the fellowship. If these people are on the airwaves or on the internet, then test them, and if, if they're found to be false, um, don't support them, either monetarily or or by giving them clicks, likes, and subscribes, which often translate in our society into revenue for these content creators. Chuck Missler quipped a long time ago, there are many ministries God would like to shut down if only their supporters would let him do so. And I love I love Chuck Missler's quips there. We'll move on. Uh, verse 6. If your brother or mother's son or your son or daughter or the wife you cherish or your friend who is like your own soul entices, and remember that's the Hebrew word that can also mean seduce, uh, you secretly saying, let's go and serve other gods whom neither you nor your fathers have known or the gods of the people who are around you, near you, or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other, you shall not consent to him or listen to him. Your eye shall not pity him, nor shall you spare or conceal him. Instead, you shall most certainly kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you shall stone him to death, because he has attempted to drive you away from the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God keeps coming back to his big work for the, the nation there. Then all Israel will hear about it and be afraid and will not do such a wicked thing among you again. So idolatry is a big, big deal, and I don't think it's any less of a threat or a big deal in our lives today. Uh, it can take many forms. Some are very overt, like flirting with someone who is not your spouse, but some can be more subtle, like um, being more excited about your football team than you are about being a, a saved uh, child of God. I think you know we need to check these things. The enemy will do anything he can to drive us away and separate us from the Lord. And we can't kill the seducer, but we can spiritually kill. That is, we can get rid of any idolatry uh, that is in our lives. The, the solution is don't give it any quarter. Don't give it any room to take hold. If you hear in any one of your cities that the Lord your God is going to live in, anyone saying that some worthless men have gone out and have seduced the inhabitants of the city, uh, you shall investigate, search out, and inquire thoroughly. I love this. Basically, be a Berean. And if it is true, in the matter certain that this abomination has been committed among you, you must certainly strike the inhabitants of the city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroy it and its cattle with the edge of the sword. Wiping out the entire town seems a bit harsh, but in that day, it was very much a community culture. Um, if basically sin of the few was the response responsibility for everyone. And the thought was, if they allowed this to go on, then they're all kind of a party to it. If others in the community opposed the idolatry, then they should have dealt with it. Because they didn't, the inference is that they tolerated it and the, the command is to wipe them out. Again, the spiritual application for us uh, is is understand, don't react. Acts 1711, be a Berean. Don't assume someone is automatically a false prophet. Test them. Use your, use your noodle, use your mind to, to think about this. I love how God does this. After all these statements on not tolerating idolatry, he reminds us that we can't go on which hunts. We have to examine each person thoroughly in order to prevent misunderstandings and in order to falsely accuse someone as being an evildoer when maybe, you know, maybe they just tripped up on their words or something like that. We have to give people the benefit of the doubt until proven. Otherwise, we definitely don't spread any gossip. Uh, but failing to recognize a true prophet is just as bad as giving audience to a false prophet. First John, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. This brings us to the point of um, our, our witness uh, causes others to fail to identify Jesus. Have, have we ever thought about this? Specifically, Jews who reject Jesus, they do so in part because Jesus' own followers, i.e. Gentile Christians, claim that Jesus came to do away with the Torah. In, in other words, they're using our own words as Christians, the very group who's supposed to be representing Jesus. They conclude, they look at us, and they conclude that Jesus is a false prophet by this definition. They point to that evidence that many Christians do not live their lives remotely consistent with the ethics of the Torah, and they teach against the Torah. They teach against God's word. We're saying this whole part 
part is done away with. So I think as Christians, we must realize this and we have to stop perpetuating this misunderstanding that is leading others to reject God's Messiah. We want to point fingers at them, but as a community of, of Gentile believers, we may need to look in the mirror, uh, strive to live godly lives, ethical lives, be blameless in the sight of the world. And blameless means humbly righteous. That doesn't mean perfect. And then we, we should respond with love to those who speak evil of or misrepresent Jesus, whether they're believers or non, non-believers. So we need to you know handle this, um, you know, I, I would say professionally, but ethically and honoring uh, in, in a way that honors our king. Then you shall gather, this is after you've tested and find that they're true and, and you've, you've uh, you know, annihilated those who are perpetual in this, you should gather its plunder in the middle of a public square, burn the city and all its plunder with fire as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. Don't leave any of it. Uh, don't rebuild the city. Nothing at all. What is designated for destruction is to cling to your hand. Don't keep any any loot from this because uh, just like, uh, was it Rebecca that kept the idol? Uh, <laughs> you know, they uh, it just gets a hold and it just causes problems. The Lord may turn from his burning anger. Look at what God wants to do. God wants to show mercy, have compassion, and make you increase just as he has sworn to your fathers if you will listen to the voice of the Lord your God, keeping all his commandments, which I'm commanding you today and doing what is right in the sight of the Lord your God. Look at God wants to show us mercy and he wants us to do what is right. So, uh, you know, surface application, burn and never repair an adulterous city, never give benefit, uh, never derive benefit from an adulterous city. And I think spiritual application is whenever idolatry is identified in our life, we need to get rid of it. Maybe sometimes it's a literal destruction that is in mind. If you saw the movie Fireproof, you probably remember the scene here where Kirk Cameron is portraying a husband who was addicted to pornography and as well as he was coveting a yacht instead of, you know, giving attention to his wife. Once he realized how his hands were clinging onto these things instead of what was truly important, he took his computer out in the yard and he smashed it with a baseball bat all while his neighbor curiously looked on and, and thought thought Kirk was a little bit crazy there. He was smashing the vehicle that was leading to his idolatry, just just as the Israelites were to burn the city where the idolaters were promoted. There's a definite connection there. There may be situations where we're profiting from another's idolatry. And um, for example, if there's a product that's maybe legal but is addicting, and we have this uh, stock in our retirement account, then, then what are we doing to contribute to the problem is something to look at. Maybe your city or state wants to legalize something for the tax revenue, then they say they're going to use the tax revenue to help people with the sin that they're promoting. So that's, that's a problem. Problem. <laughs> and that would be profiting from idolatry in our city. And that's something we, we should definitely stand against. So some key points, root out idolatry. Do not consent, do not entertain a seducer. Next, enjoy his fellowship. Rejoice in the community that he's given us. I mean, we, we can't say Deuteronomy doesn't apply to our lives because we've got some great application here. Humbly follow his path. Do not do what is right in your own eyes. Do what is right in the Lord's eyes. Every meal is an opportunity for praise and fellowship with him. That, that's a concept that kind of struck me when you see the word sacrifice. Uh, slaughter is, is all, all tied up in a sacrifice and and uh, communion and fellowship. Do not add or take away from God's word. Don't mix idolatry with the worship of God. That was one one of their big problems in, in the Israelite culture. Finally, test anyone claiming to be a prophet. Remove false prophets. Do not pay it, att- any attention to false prophets, but definitely listen and pay attention to, to prophets. So that's Deuteronomy 12 and 13. We'll be back next time with Deuteronomy's uh, more than likely chapters 14, 15, and 16 next time along the Talmudim way. Mm-hmm.